it's wild that like the American public education system literally teaches you about like oil barons as a good. It's so weird. That that part is like already weird to me. Like the idea that you're like talking about titans of industry automatically like kind of gives the game away, you know? Fordlandia, Henry Ford's Hello, country everybody. in Brazil. Today we're going to be talking about that time that Henry Ford built his own country in the Amazon rainforest. And more specifically, how that country became one of the most expensive what? and lethal disasters in industrial history. We're going to talk about how something that started out with most likely good intentions became such a monumental failure. And more specifically, how a flagship of the American idea was unable to overcome nature and the culture surrounding it. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around after the ad as we get into the downfall of Fordlandia, as well as the greater concept of man and industry versus human will and nature itself. But before you get your daily dose of existential dreams, little to no introduction. Can I hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We're gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, Thank you for watching. Henry Ford is a man who needs little to no introduction. His innovations such as Ford Motors and the assembly line led to the industrialization of not only America in the early 1900s, but the world at large. Ford's Wait. system of a nine to five workday with decent pay, as well as rapid production of things like automobiles. Please tell me he does, he, he talks about Henry Ford being like a Nazi and stuff, right? that the workers could actually buy the products that they were building. This was a far cry from the 19th century ideas of there being distinct classes of citizens where some make high-end products that only a few can purchase. Because of this, many feel that Henry Ford was the first to establish the middle or working class American culture, and Ford profited greatly from this, being one of the richest men alive in the 1920s. One of the ways that Ford managed to keep costs low and profits high was by owning the manufacturing rights of everything that was required in assembly. In other words, he didn't just own the factory where the cars were assembled. He owned the mills that would produce the steel. He owned the lumber yards that would produce the wood. And in the early 1920s, he owned nearly every aspect of material needed to build his vehicles. Like, yeah, he, he made it uh, really cost effective by describing vertical and horizontal integration which is, you know, monopolies. Say for one, rubber. Today, rubber production is often overlooked as are things like metal and wood production. But in the 1920s, before the invention of synthetic rubber, it was a much more engaging process. Around the turn of the century from the 1800s into the 1900s, rubber trees were exclusively found in the South American jungles. The process for extracting rubber is workers would walk into the jungle until they located a rubber tree, to which they would then cut a line into the tree itself, and then whenever they got to a point where late yeah we found wait didn't we watch this together or did i see a tiktok about this i had no idea that you fucking literally put a you put a goddamn plate basically under the tree and it leaks in and you just pull it by hand off of that you pull it by hand off of that fucking plate it's awesome Latex began seeping out, they would place a spigot into the tree in order to tap it and drain the latex into a bucket. That latex was then taken home where it would be boiled in a sort of kiln and then these mounds of rubber would be sold to bidders by private farmers who were just walking and finding rubber trees in the middle of the jungle. Not only was this a very slow process, but it was also unreliable. If someone like Henry Ford wanted to reliably buy rubber, which mind you would require millions of pounds worth of rubber for all of the seals, hoses, and tires for his vehicles, then he would have to hope that thousands of farmers across the Amazon rainforest just so happened to have a good supply of rubber and haven't already sold that to anyone else. However, while again, Brazil was for a time the only place in the world that one could get rubber because it was the only place that had rubber trees, in 1876, a man by the name of Henry Wickham, who does have a fantastic mustache, stole thousands of rubber tree seeds and brought them back to England. From there, England began to distribute them to their more tropical colonies and after growing them in plantations for several years, became the 
number one supplier of rubber. Because of this, England became the world's number one distributor of rubber, while Brazil faded into obscurity as people quit purchasing from their local workers. Ford hated the British rubber trade because Britain had a monopoly on rubber and could pretty much charge whatever they want. Ford couldn't really do anything about it though because unlike a steel mill, Again, the British had a monopoly on rubber. Henry Ford simply just made products cheaper by Henry Ford made products cheaper by literally vertical integration. You can't just build a rubber tree plantation in the middle of Detroit if he decides he wants to make it himself. That was until one day when Henry Ford was having a conversation with his friend, President Teddy Roosevelt, who told Henry of his adventures to the Amazon rainforest and how he thinks it would be an excellent idea to begin producing rubber back in the country where rubber production started. And here we have the first mistake as Ford consulted pretty much no one else and decided to spend all of his money on this massive rainforest production facility. Now it seems that the Brazilian government as well as the local workers and journalists were thrilled with the idea of Ford building a facility in the Amazon. See, the Brazilian government was also upset at the British rubber trade because it took all of the business out of Brazil. So they saw Ford's new construction project as a potential return to form. Ford sent some diplomats down to Brazil to make negotiations with the local government and eventually decided on purchasing 5,625 square miles of land for $125,000, or by today's standards, over two million. Now, while that may not sound like a lot for the amount of land being purchased, this was completely undeveloped jungle, and the government pretty much pulled a fast one on Ford and charged him way more than the land was actually worth. For example, Ford wanted to begin building immediately in 1926, however what he did not know and would have known if he consulted anyone who was actually from the region, the Tapajos River, which was the nearby river and the only means of transportation in or out of the region of land he just bought, was about to enter its dry season, and during the dry season the river retracts so much that there's no means of getting supplies to the undeveloped land. This would also mean for the foreseeable future Ford could only ship materials in and out for half of the year. Furthermore, his deal with the Brazilian government said that he could run the land. Apparently, Wendigum basically started Boogalovos. Wait, what? Really? What the fuck? Um, <clears throat> what? You, you guys are trolling, right? There's no fucking shot. Knowing Better had a better video on this that doesn't brush over Ford being Nazi. I think the, the part of uh, Knowing Better is... Knowing Better is talking about company towns across the board and not necessarily just about... Which is actually, a, a, an unironically, a better video because, like, I don't know anything about Fordlandia, but as soon as uh, he was, as soon as Winnegan was talking about it, I immediately thought that this sounds a lot like a company town that he was trying to build, and it just failed. But I like, I like and this. With I, I like that it's hyper focusing on Ford. Relations and rules he liked as long as 9% of the profits went to the Brazilian government. Everyone around Ford, all of his advisors and family members said that this was a terrible idea. Not only would so much need to be spent in order to build this facility, that it would take decades for them to see a return on their investment, but Ford's plan was not only to build a factory in the middle of the jungle, but to build an entire city in the middle of the jungle. And that's where we get into the aspect of Fordlandia that in my opinion elevates it from a bad business venture into a historical marvel. And that is that Fordlandia was not just a proof of profit, but a proof of legacy. See, there's this thing seen with a lot of millionaires and billionaires throughout history, that whenever they've made their money and come to the end of their life, they begin to focus on how they'll be remembered instead of what they're doing right now. An example of this would be Walt Disney's Epcot, where during the end of his life, he too tried to build his own private city. Henry Ford grew up in a small American farming town, and he believed that that was key to the success he learned thereafter. And his plan for Fordlandia was to just take a copy of an idyllic United States Midwest town and throw it in the middle of the jungle. And then the workers of that facility- Okay, this is the part where I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that like, he doesn't dive deeper into this concept. There's no fucking way. No, Henry Ford was trying to do a company town, right? It wasn't just like an idyllic uh, Midwestern town. He was trying to develop a fundamentally flawed, a fundamentally flawed and inherently exploitative 
additionally exploitative uh, uh, structure, which is a company town. For those of you who don't know what that is, I'm not going to get into the one hour video from Knowing Better because uh, we would have to watch that for seven hours. But I guess like, you know what a company town is? At least like, it, <clears throat> think about it like this. Every part of the fucking Midwest that's like now in the Rust Belt that's destroyed, eviscerated because industry left. Take it one step further and realize that uh, when you're working for the fucking steel mill, they're giving you steel mill tokens and you're buying directly from the steel mill's own market with the steel mill tokens, not necessarily, or, and you're paying, uh, and, you're, and your rent is basically also um, a part of your, your, uh, a part of your wage, uh, a part of your uh, wages. Mining is a better example. No, I know, but the reason why I mentioned uh, towns like, you know, the towns that are eviscerated is because they are not necessarily company towns. They're not necessarily company towns per se because there isn't that same level of control, direct control. But a lot of the Rust Belt operates in a similar capacity where they, where uh, one industry comes to town, they fucking pay for the school, they pay for the roads, they pay for everything, and when they fuck off and leave, it leaves the town eviscerated. It's just a couple uh, degrees of separation removed from like actually a company town. That's what most of, uh, that's what the Heartland America, that's what Heartland America looks like. They would not only receive high wages, but also receive free health care at their own private hospital, free education for their children at their own supplied schools, as well as churches, restaurants, entertainment, and everything else that Ford saw fit. The management. This is not a good thing or staff of the facility would be American workers who go down to South America in order to run it, and then those doing manual labor would be local Brazilians. In other words, Ford had enough money, and the reason that he put away advice to not do this was because this wasn't just another profit venture for him. This was a form of idealist diplomacy. During a meeting with his high-ranking staff where he was urged to not go through with the concept of Fordlandia, Ford said, We are not going to South America to make money, but to help develop that wonderful and fertile land. Ford thought that what was best for him would be best for everyone. That's and that all that they needed was a little nudge in the right direction. So how did that little nudge go? Well, let's find out. As mentioned earlier, one of Ford's contributions to the business world was the concept of the nine to five workday. And while this concept may have worked in American industry, this was not the practiced in Brazilian industry. See, in the Brazilian jungle, it's not uncommon for it to be around 110 degrees by noon. So in Brazil, it was common for workers to wake up very early at four or five in the morning, work until the sun got to its peak around 10, take a several hour break throughout the day, then go back to work at four to finish up. This not only gave them a large break period in the middle of the day, but kept them from collapsing in the Amazon heat. Well, to Ford, this was completely unacceptable because again, he's approaching a South American operation with a North American doctrine. Because of that, in 1926, whenever the jungle began to be physically cleared, the workers were working through the hottest parts of the day. This led to workers becoming incredibly weak and people began catching illnesses such as malaria and yellow fever, as well as several accounts of workers just collapsing. Now, remember that detail I mentioned earlier about the water levels not allowing them to get equipment to the area? Well, because of this, the majority of the labor had to be done by hand, which caused its own problems. See, this is the Amazon rainforest, and the last thing you want to do is be sticking your hand at the base of trees or into random leaves or dirt piles or whatever. Because of this, several people were dying before the facility's true production ever really began. People would reach under trees and be bit by pit vipers. There were several accounts of men running into swarms of hornets and being stung everywhere. Some accounts even said that men would lay their hand on the ground and immediately their entire- Imagine people getting excited for free healthcare from Elon if they live on and do all their daily transactions on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, let me, let me explain something to you. Uh, I do not think that, I just want to make this very clear. I do not believe that Henry Ford was idealistically trying to go to Brazil and build a company town in Brazil. I do believe that he was very frustrated with the monopolistic power that the British had, like he pointed out, and wanted to go to a less developed nation at the time 
and take advantage of that less developed nation and you know improve the productive capabilities and basically build a company town and it failed company towns are awful they're an awful idea can you imagine can you imagine living at twitter under elon musk owned and operated properties where you are working every day at the behest of Elon Musk, and Elon Musk is responsible for literally your health care, and all of that is tied to your productivity. It is basically slavery by a different name, which is why a lot of company towns failed in the United States of America. Uh, he wanted to increase the productive forces. Motherfucker was a Marxist for real. Yeah, totally. Henry Ford, definitely a Marxist. Yeah. <laughs> Me retweeting Elon and telling him he has good memes for healthcare. Yeah. Entire arm would be covered in ants, and then these bites and blisters would break out from where they were ate up by them. Not only that, but the first Americans who came to the region were not acclimated to the region itself. As the land was being cleared, the first things that were built were the homes for the American workers. Most of these workers brought their families with them, and it was very common for children to become sick due to the new environment. And these homes, which were modeled exactly like American homes, did a horrible job at keeping out the wildlife. Several men had stories of waking up in the middle of the night and seeing vampire bats licking blood off of them. As a matter of fact, it was a reoccurring problem that jaguars were stealing babies out of their homes. And in one instance, a woman who again came from America to work at Fordlandia was killed while bathing in the river by a caiman. To give you an idea of how chaotic the first couple years of production were, the lead manager over all of this was a ship captain named Einar Oxholm. He was initially a ship captain who brought supplies to the region, and then I guess they just figured he was really good at being a captain. So they were like, hey, you want to also manage workers, production facility, assisted living, health care and education? And he was like, I mean, I'm already here. <laughs> In 1929, only a couple years after production had began, three of his children had died from fever and his other child was stillborn. Overall, in 1930, when production actually started, between the workers who were clearing the grounds as well as the American workers who died of illness and caimans and jaguars and everything else, over 90 people had already died. At this point, too much cost and time had been sunken into the production, and perhaps to Ford, something greater than cost was also at risk. A couple years earlier, in 1928, the water tower bearing the Ford logo was placed in the town. This was seen as a symbolic completion of the town, and Ford gave it the name of Fordlandia. The town itself was quite impressive. The town was not only able to house 10,000 people, but a few of the amenities there were a hospital, several schools, a library, a hotel, a swimming pool, a playground, a golf course, its own power plant, phone lines, sawmill, and a church. And all of these were fully staffed, mostly by American workers. A lot of workers at the time talked about how bizarre it was to essentially step out of the jungle and into a Midwest American town fully staffed by Americans, and then to move your entire family there and essentially exist as a US citizen even for a short while in this kind of make-believe place. And perhaps this make-believe place could- We literally still do this, by the way. Like, American bases all around the country, as shouts out to the US military. And also, an extension of American military superpower is uh, Saudi Arabia, where there are entire company towns that literally do that. The Green Zone in Iraq, where, like everywhere we go, we do the same shit. There's just corporate campuses in America too, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. Yeah, that's why we talk about um, neo-feudalism in the, in the tech space. The more unaffordable housing is, the more there is a need for campus sites with more affordable housing. How do you pay for that? Well, you pay for that by working for the company, but the company also owns the housing. Could have been more like a fairy tale if it wasn't for Ford's insistence on proper living. See, in 1928, whenever the town was officially crowned, they planted the rubber trees and began hiring workers for the sawmill. 
See, it would take the trees a while to grow, so the idea was they could make money out of this sawmill selling wood from the Amazon up until it becomes time to actually start harvesting the rubber from the trees. Well, these workers who showed up to work at the sawmill were immediately greeted by a whole lot of new roles. See, it was true that Ford was paying very well. As a matter of fact, some reports say he was paying $5 an hour, which at the time was insane money. However, while that may be very lucrative in the United States, the Amazon rainforest isn't exactly a place of consumerism. So even if you made a ton of money, you couldn't buy more than the local market is willing to sell for American dollar. I say that now to give emphasis to how huh. annoying the following rules are. For one, Ford was a firm believer in the idea of the strong, hard-willed American man. And because of that, he huh. believed in putting away all vices. Bro, that's insane. Come on. There's no way. What the fuck? Yeah, Ford wasn't like, Ford was the hard-willed American man. He was a rugged fascist, man. He was just straight up like a full-blown. He was a straight up full-blown fascist. What the fuck? This man did not do his research as crazy. I don't think, I don't think that he didn't do his research. I think he's just not talking about it either to be charitable to Wendigoon. Maybe he's not talking about it because he doesn't think uh, he doesn't think it pertains to the story, or maybe there's a different reason. Wendigun is chill, chill. He leans right, chill. What? Don't want to alienate his audience. I don't know. Isn't this the most centrist normie take? I don't know. I didn't grow up in America and I didn't, uh, I'm not a product of the American education system. So I don't know how like people understand Henry Ford, but it's pretty wild to me that like not when you're like an independent YouTuber, it's pretty wild to me not to mention, um, you know, the, the political aspirations or the ideological, uh, attitudes that uh, motivated a man like Henry Ford. But you know, that's, that's wild, I guess. I don't know. Is that, is that not something that people talk about? Maybe they don't. It's pretty similar to this video. Wait, really? I learned that Henry Ford was a Nazi from you. I'm 30 years old. Wait, what the fuck? Bro, we learned that Washington had wooden teeth. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that one. Yeah. <clears throat> Man, American education. Yo, people say CRT and shit, and then, like, they literally... They literally act like George Washington kept slaves but treated them very well. And there was rigorous debate about whether or not slavery should continue when it's like, bro, you're literally saying they were debating about enslaving humans. Like at a time when clearly the motherfucker who followed George Washington didn't have slaves. So like that should give you, that should give any fucking free thinker the idea immediately that like maybe slavery was still seen as like an immoral concept. Like why? Why, why is it that the second president literally did not have slaves. Like he was like, no, that's fucked up, actually. Doesn't that basically imply, like, th doesn't that... I didn't know he was a Nazi until so I started watching you. He re He's revered as a great businessman. Bro, we didn't even learn that the USR contributed anything to World War II unless we took a class on it in college. And when we took that class, we thought our professor was communist. Yeah. The thing is, I get why... Dude, th this is another, like, American concept. But, like, you don't learn about titans of industry in Turkish school. Like, there's no such thing. You learn about, like, you know, people who are involved in the state, and that's it. Like, it's wild that, like, the American public education system literally teaches you about, like, oil barons as a good. It's so weird. That, that part is, like, already weird to me. Like, the idea that you're, like, talking about titans of industry automatically, like kind of showcase how fucking it kind of gives the game away you know like why the fuck do you learn about henry ford at school i i do legitimately think that that's weird in general i know that it's hard to shake that like you're gonna say well what do you mean this guy is uh, a very important person right but like other 
in other places, in, in other parts of the world, I don't think they teach you about like, you know, who the fuck was the most successful businessman. America's built on the great man hist- uh, theory of history. Yeah. You know about the pledge every morning? Yeah, we do that too. Uh, I did that too. Yeah. That's pretty normal stuff. Social cohesion is is learned behavior uh, through the education system. That that part is, I would not only say understandable, but also like depending on what your goals are, uh, almost a necessity for, uh, you know, nation building. In my school, we were taught and then taught and then introduced monopolies and how we stopped them. We, well, we did. There was a time. Every Monday in Turkey, not every morning. No, Istiklal Marsh is every Monday. Uh, the the uh, the the pledging of the allegiance is like every day. I thought every morning. I think we did it every morning. Was there anything like the pledge in Turkey? Yes, there is the the national anthem that you actually sing on every Monday when the school first starts, and then every Friday when the school closes, and then you pledge allegiance every morning uh, as well. But I don't know if they do that anymore. They stopped that in like 2009. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, that's, or did they stop that in America? Are you American or are you Turkish? Henry Ford, John Rockefeller, Carnegie, Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan, the History Channel made a show called Men Who Built America, which is straight up propaganda. By the way, like, I'm not even saying it's uh, unnecessary to teach people about, like, the guy who fucking invented the assembly line, Right. But it still strikes me as odd that you have such an emphasis on titans of industry in your historical development. And, and it's done from the lens of like the, the industrial giants overall doing the most, like not even like bad things, right? And, and like it's not necessarily the, the state Whereas, like, there is no, there, I don't think any other, maybe other countries' history has similar perspectives, but I can't remember a single moment from, like, Turkish history where we just, like, hyper-focused on titans of industry because uh, nation-state development in Turkey was, was built on the backs of nationalization. Like, a lot of the initiatives were originally built by the state itself. Now, obviously, Turkey is a, is a newer country. And then before that, you have, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire. So it's just like there's no, there's no such thing as like, uh, you know, who were the, who were the champions that, <laughs> that really privatized key sectors that were otherwise uh, in other formations controlled by the government. Henry Ford is a figurehead at the rise of automobile manufacturing, which was considered a major part of American identity, personal vehicle ownership. That's true. That, that is actually really, really true. So because of that, alcohol and tobacco were completely banned from anywhere in Fordlandia. Prohibition was going on in the United States at the time, and Ford was a big fan of it. So he decided to apply that to this area of Fordlandia, even though alcohol wasn't outlawed in the rest of Brazil. While workers could move their family members into the houses of Fordlandia, You could not bring in a woman if you were not married to them. Houses were also frequently inspected by the managers in order to make sure that there was no contraband. Keep in mind, most of the Brazilians didn't speak English and most of the Americans... This is so funny. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, they get to do that. When it's the fucking company town, bitch, what do you mean? What are you going to do about it? Fucking uh, go back to America? Good luck. Yeah. I wonder... I wonder why s- such strong emphasis on control here down to like your individual consumption down to uh down to who you uh keep in your company in your private home no level of privacy whatsoever it almost feels like there's uh, some underlying ideological reasoning for this where these are not people at all these are just well played well paid slaves okay who are still there under incredibly coercive conditions because they can't really leave either. Mm. Odd. Much to think about, much to consider. You know? Americans didn't speak Portuguese. To combat this, just five miles down the Tapajos River was a location the workers had set up known as the Island of Innocence. This was just outside of the border of Fordlandia, so the... (laughs) 
from the Portuguese Wikipedia, the workers revolted due to working conditions and not wanting to eat hamburgers. The Brazilian army had to come in and save the managers that went into hiding in the jungle. <laughs> oh, that's fucking awesome, dude. The Brazilian was like, yo, fuck this hamburger bullshit, dude. What the hell? Staff couldn't really do anything about it. And on this island of innocence was a series of bars and brothels. And the only protests that the staff could give to workers is they put out a policy stating that venereal disease would not be covered in their healthcare plan. Ford also believed that the only right kind of entertainment was... Obviously, obviously, with employer-backed health insurance, we never have things like this. We never have this uh, kind of, of personal control, like, for example... Uh, your company can't say we're no longer uh, allowing you. We're no longer letting insurance cover contraceptives. Oh, fuck. Oh. Oh, wait. That's. Oh, shit, dude. Fuck, man. <laughs> time, keeps pa time keeps changing, but many things stay the same, you know? American entertainment. Because of that, things like soccer or football to the Brazilians was banned. Like, straight up, you just can't play soccer. I guess it wasn't apple pie enough for him. And keep in mind, this isn't just the workers this applies to. This applies to the wives. As By the way, this is my favorite part of, like, fascists. If there is ever, like, a funny thing that you can look to fascists, it's like, their, their endless need for control and, like, the, the esoteric shit that they believe in, I think that that is fucking hilarious. And, like, how self-serious they are about both their ideology and also, like, every other aspect of it. So then they will, like, they'll make up rules like this. And then you have to follow it. And you're like, why the fuck? Like, what? This makes no sense. And it's like, don't ask. It is what it is. More redundant than endless need for control? It's not. It, it's not. It's not redundant. I, I bet you, in his mind, he probably thought, like, this is important because, like, it's not American enough, you know what I mean? We must instill the American work ethic in the in the minds of these uh, in the minds of these Brazilians who are uh, barbaric. Otherwise, you would give up on it. Such a silly thing. As well as the children of the workers who just can't play soccer for whatever reason. So, okay, if you ban that, then what kind of entertainment do you have in order to replace it? Well, as mentioned earlier, there was a playground for the kids, a golf course, and a swimming pool. And that was it for the entertainment except for one thing, and that was a square dancing hall. And I'm not kidding, and I'm emphasizing this because this was something that Ford really pushed. Most likely because he met his wife at a square dancing hall, but also because he despised jazz music. So because of reasons like this, it wasn't just American culture being transported to the jungle. Huh. Hmm. Why did he despise jazz music? It's just like such a weird, hmm. I wonder... Who also at the same exact time despised jazz music and considered to be an abhorrent form of culture that was uh, morally degenerate made by uh, lesser beings? Oh, he's racist. That's why he... Oh, yeah, that's right. It's because black people made jazz music and it lacked the inherent structure of like classical composition that white people made, so... Obviously, it was a lesser form, but not only as a lesser form, but also on top of that, it was like uh, breaking people's minds. And uh, black people made every music, to be honest. <laughs> well, that is true, especially for contemporary music. It's funny to say that right as I was talking about like what fascists think are good forms of music, like, you know, classical compositions and stuff like that. And it immediately... It immediately uh, is is uh, reminding me of the the fucking dudes, the black Israelites to say like Beethoven was black, <laughs> Beethoven black one hundred percent, Mozart was black. Also true, yes. I know you're not saying that. I just think it's funny because I can't stop thinking about that now. It was Ford's idealized representation of what American culture should be transplanted into the jungle. And believe it or not, groups of children who have never been to the United States and don't speak English 
aren't exactly big fans of square dancing. However, perhaps the most annoying detail of Ford's Shocking. idealism was his diet plan. See, Ford was a vegetarian and one of the first proponents of clean eating. Oh, oh no. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Nah. No fucking, oh, dude. Oh my God. What's up with these fucking fascists, bro? Why? Why is it like this? Why? Why? Why, bro? I can think about another. I I can think of another one of these motherfuckers who also didn't like consuming animal products. What's up with that? Eating essentially just a diet of rice and vegetables, and that's like it. So he thought, well, this diet's great for me. It'll be great for the ten thousand Brazilians in the middle of the jungle. Awesome. So workers who were used to eating their own meat were now forced to eat an entirely vegetarian diet. It should also be noted that the American managers who did not care for Ford's vegetarian ideas would ship in meat themselves in order to make things like steak and hamburgers. This created another level of disparity between the workers and the management as the workers who have been forced to eat these vegetarian diets and not play soccer and square dance got to look over at these American managers who were eating hamburgers and probably smoking cigars and listening to the radio as well. One aspect that was interesting whenever Fordlandia was built was the idea that every worker would be treated as if they're at an American restaurant. In other words, there wasn't a line like a cafeteria that the workers would go to and then scoop their food as in most assembly lines. Instead, they would sit at tables and waiters would come to them, ask for their order, and then bring it out. Again, their options were like rice or celery, but still, it made them feel special. That was until in 1930 when they decided this was inefficient and switched over to the cafeteria line, which seems to be the final breaking point for a lot of people. Like, you know, obviously all these rules, random house inspections, regulations, and diet was bad enough to begin with, but at least they got some level of dignity whenever they sat down to eat, and now that was taken from them. Something else they all really hated was a time clock system where you would punch your card and clock in and clock out. Again, while this worked in American industry, the Brazilian workers hated the concept of walking to the punch-in desk and then going to the place they need to start working. This also compacted with the fact that a 9 to 5 job was not typical of Brazilian workers. So all of these elements were at a breaking point, and keep in mind, no one has made any rubber out of this deal yet. But in 1930, in the cafeteria that used to be a restaurant, an argument started between one of the brick masons and the current manager. Now, I've seen conflicting reports on what the argument was specifically over, I saw some that said it was an argument over the workers not following their diet properly. I saw some that said they were going to cut wages from the workers because they were eating too much. But regardless of what the specifics were, everyone was so ready to start a fight over something, this seemed like a good thing to start it over. The shouting match kept escalating until eventually nearly all of the 3,000 workers were rioting within Fordlandia. Now there was a previous sort of semi-riot that happened in 1928 whenever the workers weren't given proper food, but that was just more so like a strike for a couple days and then it subsided. This was a group of people who were angry and setting stuff on fire and breaking things. The first thing that they did was destroy the time clock punch-in system. And I just want to know how that conversation went because someone convinced them that they need to leave the cafeteria and go beat up the time clock. From there, they just started destroying everything. They destroyed parts of the sawmill, they destroyed parts of the rubber plant, which wasn't really running yet. They even started destroying several of their own houses. And all of the American <laughs> staff freaked out and got on a boat to go hide and float out in the river while they just tore stuff up for a few days. I love this. My favorite detail is that apparently the mob saw the American chef and chased him into the woods where he was hiding for four days. And I can just imagine like this group of people so mad and upset at the management. And that, you know, they're obviously upset over the diet that they have to eat. And I just imagine like a chef running out and he's got like the stereotypical like giant chef hat and like the mustache and everything. And they're like, there he is, get him. <laughs> and the workers who escaped on the boats called back to the home office in Detroit, and Detroit called the Brazilian government, and Brazil sent in the military.
It's crazy that the Amer oh god. The American government is so fucking powerful at that point, even back then, that they can get the Brazilian government to like squash a labor action in a fucking country a thousand miles away. Like, that's wild. I mean, I get it. I get why they had to do it. But, like, always the same fucking shit, dude. Always. The military dispatchment was 12 people with rifles. Oh, really? Military to calm down the workers. And after a few days of breaking stuff, they eventually calmed down. After this event, a new manager was appointed by the name of Archibald Johnston. And supposedly he made things a little bit better. Like, he still enforced the diet and all that. But he convinced the staff to, like show a couple movies in the completely abandoned square dancing hall from time to time. And you know, maybe he even got a little crazy and let them kick around a soccer ball every now and then. But after the 1930 incident, which is referred to by locals as the Breaking Pan Revolt, things were pretty normal among the workers. But now I know what you're thinking. What about the rubber? And that's a good question. What about the rubber? Well, remember how I mentioned earlier, Britain had a monopoly on the rubber industry because they had set up all these plantations in their colonies? Well, Ford's management in the late 20s decided to plant these rubber trees in plantation rows. The idea being that's how crops are grown everywhere else in the world, so you might as well grow rubber trees the same way. The issue with that is that in the British colonies huh. like Sri Lanka where they were growing the rubber trees, there weren't any natural predators or diseases that could kill the trees, so it didn't matter how many you grow together. However, in the Brazilian forest, there were a ton of things that can kill rubber trees. Everything from a form of blight as well as caterpillars whose primary food source is rubber trees. Now these things are all over the jungle, but they're normally not that big of a problem. That's because rubber trees are solitary. So if one tree gets infected with blight or caterpillars and that tree dies, it's probably fine because all the other trees are too far away to get infected themselves. Well, whenever you grow all of these trees right next to each other in a plantation, you're essentially making a giant hotbed for things like blight and caterpillars to grow in. Not to mention rubber trees have very large root systems, and whenever you grow them next to each other, it diminishes their growth. So for some reason that they couldn't figure out, but they would have if they asked literally anyone who knew what they were talking about, the trees were not growing as fast as they were supposed to be, and as soon as they sprouted leaves, they were killed by caterpillars or disease. The caterpillars even started that. to trick the workers. The caterpillars usually eat the leaves from the bottom, and the workers would pick them off and literally fill buckets full of them and then just burn the buckets. So the caterpillars adapted and started eating on top of the leaves. So whenever the workers looked up through the trees, they'd think the tree's fine and then it would be dead a couple days later. So not only were the workers upset and things bad for the people living in Fordlandia, but the rubber wasn't even being produced. And that wasn't the only problems they had with rubber production, because as soon as they started to harvest it, workers routinely got sick and just passed out. One reason for this was, again, the whole 9 to 5 workday, and they had to be out there in 110 degree weather. Which also, side note- Like, every aspect of this is like, dude, just ask a person. Like, like you could have done your company town, you know, uh, a feudalism uh, operation in Brazil, if you just like asked three guys, you know, asked one guy, maybe two, possibly three. But that would require you to probably ask Brazilian people, I suspect, which, uh, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how Henry Ford felt about the Brazilian. Does he have, I, I don't know. He might've thought that they were savages too, just like, cause they're not American. The best part is that Ford eventually decided he needed something to do outside of work, so he built him a fucking golf course. Oh, yeah, no, I know. Uh, they talked about it. He brought it up briefly. Uh, he was very racist. I thought they were savages. Yeah. Um, he, he made them. He, he was like, you can't play soccer. You can't play football. You can, only, <laughs> you can only play golf and do line dancing. No, he was a very successful car manufacturer. He knows better than random Brazilian people. Yeah, exactly, which is exactly what happened. All, by the way, every part of this was in the interest of monopolization. Remember, every part of this was in the interest of literally eliminating one other part or, or basically integrating one other part of the production, rubber. That's it. So, like, he fucking failed on that front. 
and the Brazilians who knew were looking at it with that face, we shall we shall remind that eugenicism establishes Iberian man closer to black people than proper whites. What? What the fuck, bro? Why did you write it like that? It's Christ, dude. What the fuck is a proper white? I made you an anime opening? Yes, I'm going to watch it today. Reanimate. Do not worry. Fear not. Of course I'm going to watch that. It's on okay, buddy, right? Bro, explain yourself. Okay, bad wording. My uh, my bad, but racism lore says Irish and Iberian are not white. Oh, he meant <coughs> proper whites like the Anglo-Saxon Protestants. <coughs> um, yeah. Like Benjamin, Benny Frank style. Also, eugenicism has been disproven into the ground. Yes. The only, the only science that we agree on here at the Hassan Abbey broadcast is the top of the hour ad break and phrenology. Not phrenology of like, um, you know, black people's skulls and white people's skulls and that kind of thing, but cop phrenology. It's called thumb phrenology. The concept that you are a cap, a signed cop at birth. Now, of course, um, being a signed cop at birth does not mean you are destined to be a cop, but many who are ACAP do become cops. Uh, it's also known as thumbology. Yes, uh, some have colloquially called it thumbology. Um, anyway, going back to the top of the hour ad break, though, if it's Jover, politics, White House, Biden says he doesn't have plan to visit. Yeah, yeah, Jack, look alive. Who cares? Fuck those guys. Uh, MVTH uh, underscore you. Thank you for the five. Get the subs line. Five people are no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. Here's the three-minute ad break now. This lore is a part of the Hassan Abbey Extended Universes? Yes. For those of you who are just tuning in, yes, I am, a, uh, I am an advocate for uh, cop phrenology, also known as thumbology. Yeah, Biden just wants to play on expert difficulty, okay? Why are you guys making fun of him? The Southern he has basically eliminated Ohio from the map. Oh, the way the latex from the rubber trees pour out is whenever they're mildly cool, it just flows. But as the temperature gets too hot, they kind of inflate and crowd up inside of the system of the tree itself. So not only were the workers getting too hot in the middle of the day, the tree was literally too hot to let out the rubber. And the other reason workers were passing out is because Ford decided that they needed to take all of the modern vaccines in the US and make the Brazilian workers take every single one of them all at once. Again, while this may have had good intentions, taking people who have never taken any kind of medication in their life and making them take like 12 vaccines at once was not a good idea. I'm not sure how many people necessarily died from that, but the hospital beds were routinely full around this time. Eventually, Ford broke down and hired a botanist by the name of James Weir. James said that what effectively happened at Fordlandia is they had accidentally turned the entire country into a petri dish for blight because at this point everything u.s military style yeah i don't know how people still fail to comprehend this vaccines are given to cattle okay and if you and and they are also given to humans for the same reason you don't want your workers to fucking die that's it this is not an anti-vaxxer position by the way it's just the truth that's why they fucking it's a good thing i don't i don't have an issue with vaccines obviously i'm a big fan of vaccines um, look at myself. I, I have vaccine injuries. Uh, you know, it made me uh, gay and autistic like everybody else. Okay. But having said that all jokes aside, yes, vaccines are good. And the reason why, but the reason why your bosses want you to take the vaccine is not because they care about you and want you to live. They don't care about your living conditions. They just want you to work uninterrupted. Everything was so infected by the trees being grown close together that it doesn't matter what you grow, it's going to die in a couple years anyway. His recommendation was that they needed to scrap production on that plot of land and move it to another plot down the river known as Belterra. Also, no one liked James, apparently. I don't know if he was annoying or the workers were annoying. And then a year later in 1937, without telling anyone, he got on a boat and never came back. 
While they did begin the rubber tree production at Belterra, again it takes a few years for the trees to even grow enough that you can harvest the latex from them, by the time they were ready to harvest it was 1941 and America was about to enter World War II. And at this time Fordlandia as well as Belterra became a station for American soldiers. Little to any latex was harvested as resources were being put towards the war effort. Also around this time synthetic rubber was becoming more popular than naturally sourced rubber just because it's easier to make oh, and doesn't bummer. require you know a jungle country to do it so demand for the trees at belterra were low to begin with Damn, near the that. end of ford's life in 19 said that weird i know i know what he means but and the he majority said that of weird. its assets to his grandson henry ford i mean it, it's it, what the fuck that like does he mean like rainforest or does he mean like the conditions? Is he talking about weather conditions? Why do he say it like that? Second, Henry Ford II began by selling off a majority of the company's assets that were no longer making a profit. And the first of these to go, as you could imagine, was Fordlandia, which he sold back to the Brazilian government for $250,000. And while that is a profit of $125,000 for the price they originally paid for it, that price they originally paid was for completely undeveloped jungle. Ford had spent nearly $20 million on the construction of Fordlandia, which adjusted by today's standards due to inflation, is closer to half a billion. And while that's a massive money loss, as I mentioned earlier, Ford is near the end of his life at this point and isn't looking to make more money. The deeper loss for Ford was the lack of furthering the American idea. And as Ford believed at the end of his life, you can't culture something that doesn't want to be cultured, when in reality, it's just that you can't culture something that already has a culture. And as oh. he should have wrecked- Oh my God, saved. Oh my God. Uh, dude, I was like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, saved. Okay, holy shit. I mean, look, 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 look. This story makes so much more sense when you realize that Henry Ford was a fucking fascist. Like, and I don't mean like, oh my God, everyone's a fascist type shit. Like, literally was a fucking fascist, straight up. Um, Ford receiving the highest medal for foreigners in Nazi Germany in 1938, which is four years after Fordlandia was abandoned. Um, oh no. Okay, uh, chill, dude. I mean, I mean... I mean, why you got to bring up pamphlets, dude? I told you not to Google Henry Ford pamphlets, chatter. Why do you have to come in here and show me Henry Ford pamphlets? I mean, we already established the Nazi metal thing, but, like, why you got to do that? Oh, no. Wait, what is that? The International Jew is a four-volume set of anti-Semitic booklets or pamphlets Originally published and distributed in the early 1920s by Dearborn Publishing Company, an outlet owned by Henry Ford, the American industrialist and automobile manufacturer? What? Wow, one volume wasn't enough, you say. That he needed to do it four times. The booklets were a collection of articles originally serialized in Ford's Dearborn Independent newspaper, beginning with the International Jew... The world's problem. What? Huh. Huh. That's, I mean, what? It does devalue the word when you use it as mu so much. As someone who's new to this politics shit, I'm actually confused from you calling everyone a fascist. Bro, please. You're kidding me, right? Like... You're joking, right? Like, we're... What? He... Bro, he got a medal from... Chatter, he got a medal from Hitler. Like, he was homies with Hitler. Do you think Hitler was a fascist? He said, no, really. Like, okay, you're new to politics. Do you think Hitler... Would you say Hitler is a fascist or am I? Yeah, no, I'm saying in this situation is valid. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. So like when, when someone gets a medal from Hitler for being like the best fascist, the best fascism award, then you're like, all right, that's fine. <laughs> oh. 
Also, yes, this is a pretty good uh, take from Lake McGrew. Hassan is a left-wing political commentator. He covers the fucking worst of the worst. The people he covers are fascist. Yes. What? The NATO is doing Among Us Let's Plays? Eastern threat expert, Robin L. Katie. First of all, well, uh, very good to be here. Thanks so much for the invite. Very intimidated by you, Z, and to uh, don't have be intimidated. Watch me play. <laughs> You're such a professional, Z. You know, I'm. Uh, I have to. I have. To... I like to think about the mark I left on the planet being, uh, you know, the the meta of like getting people to play Among Us that never should have played Among Us to begin with. That's good. That's that's important for me. That's I'm glad that that this is where we're at. Yeah, technically soda popping caused this, but the Among Us meta then reaching the political sphere 100 percent is your boy. It's not even a joke. That is like an objective fact. It was Admiral Bulldog that started it. No, we're not we're not talking about that. Some of my finest work. Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to look at the Henry Ford fascist shit either. Um, let's finish the video. To this point, you can't grow something where it's already growing. It would be like starting a tree farm in the middle of the jungle. Henry Ford died two years after the selling of Fordlandia in 1947, never having actually visited the land in his entire life. While being what is undoubtedly the largest blunder of his career, it is largely forgotten to history. But to me, the most interesting part of Fordlandia is not the failure that it represents, but instead the lesson that it's created. The city of Fordlandia still stands to this day, and while the majority of the structures have been overrun by nature, the town still hosts a population of around 3,000 people. The land has spawned a new industry, an industry of tourism, as hotel owners and guides give tours of Henry Ford's decrepit city. It's so fascinating to me seeing the remnants of something that was so determined to beat nature at its own game, now years later after everyone has left. Yeah, I mean, there you go. That was from Wendigoon, the downfall of Henry Ford's secret country in Brazil, uh, secret company town in Brazil.